So ICL, and uh, ICL has really changed the refractive surgery scenario, and the expanse of the refractive surgery procedure has really improved and encompassed a very large number of our patients, and we are really able to give not only vision without glasses, but extremely good quality vision to these patients. But let us look into what are the prerequisites for the phacic IOL, and uh, obviously it has to be a crystalline lens, and let us remember that these are high myopes and they can develop cataract even early. So we need to be very sure that they are clear crystalline lenses. Age never before 18, and the refractive error definitely has to be stable by one year or so. And ametropia, of course. And these patients would have vision, and they would be in to contact lenses or spectacles, and would be wanting fake IUL, which is very important. So a patient should never be pushed into refractive surgery, least of all, even if it is fake IUL. So the laser refractive surgery, again, is not possible, and there are certain criteria which we are becoming more and more consistent on, and when the initial corneal thickness is less than 480 microns, LASIK is usually not done. And in that particular eye, if it leaves behind less than 300 microns, at one point of time it used to be 250, but now with the literature mounting up, 300, and especially if it is a high myope, we definitely need to leave 300 microns of the bed. Our topograph, uh, topography shows that there are quite a few features which we need to take into account, and the K-max not greater than 48 or 49. Refractive map shows a TKC possibility. The D value, which is a very important value, greater than 1.6. Bowtie, island, or tongue-shaped topographic features. And uh, if the elevation is greater than 10, on the anterior and posterior elevation, or if there's a difference in the PACI of greater than 10 microns between the corneal apex and the thinnest point. All these features definitely have to be taken into account, and we should uh, be aware that these patients are not good for laser refractive procedure. And if after correction, the flat K should not be less than 34 in the myopes or greater than 48 in the hyperopes. So again, we come to the prerequisites, and because the ICL goes into the uh, posterior chamber, and therefore the anterior chamber depth is very important, it has to be greater than 2.8 millimeters, and we need to take an account of the corneal thickness as well. The minimum endothelial cell density has to be assessed, and this is what we have for the age decided. No ocular pathology needs to be there, and we have to rule out glaucoma, uveitis, maculopathy, glaucoma especially, considering these are high myopes. So the ocular examination, the contact lens wear, and the discontinuation of this refraction, binocular assessment, anterior segment evaluation, especially the angles and, and the endothelium, the AC depth, the corneal topography, and a slit lamp examination and indirect ophthalmoscopy, any treatable lesions should be treated of the fundus, and then only to go in for the ICL. Now, the ICL or the toric ICL is a foldable lens, and it's implanted in the posterior chamber, sulcus located, and it's made up of the scolama, the collagen, and hema copolymer. The concept is that it is far from the endothelium, therefore it is very safe, excellent cosmesis is there, very close to the nodal point of the eye. The retinal image size definitely gives a gain and a greater effective optical zone. The stable location uh, is important because it is in the sulcus, very easy to remove, no fixations into the tissues and does not alter the eye structures. So let us look at the, the design features of this ICL, and they come in four lengths, that is 115 microns uh, millimeters, 120, 125, and 130, and uh, they range from minus three to 23 diopters. Also, the toric has the same range. So we have a very large range of uh, the designs. And if it is for hyperopia, it's the same, uh, the 11.0 uh, uh, millimeters, 11.5, 12.0 and 12.5 and we have again a great range from plus 3 to 21.5.
Now, what we use today is the Vision V4C, which has that center flow technology and which is an excellent technology with a central port, which gives a great advantage to these patients, yet no aberrations are produced in this eye. The V4C has the same design as the V4B, and the addition is the central port of 360 micron. This is a magical number because what they arrived at is in this, with this uh, dimension, it does not give rise to the uh, aberrations, but yet it gives a very good flow from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber. And this is what it is, 50 microns of less of the central thickness is there. And uh, the haptics, there are four thin, small haptics. Now, uh, the ICL, they have come up with the EVO Vision ICL, which has expanded optic sizes for myopic patients with large pupillary size, which again is something of great advantage. Now, the measurements are very important, and this is where the ICL becomes a very, very precise uh, technology. And the caliper and the digital caliper gives an excellent, good, repeatable measurement. Also, the op scan gives a very good uh, measurement. And uh, the IOL master, the anterior chamber depth has to be ascertained. The IOL master is there and the op, sc op scan is there, which give a good IOL, uh, give a good anterior chamber depth assessment. The sizing is important and it should range between point 4.25 to 0.75 millimeters, and uh, an undersized ICL or an oversized ICL can harm the eye at some times. So we have the slit lamp examination of the ICL, a high vault, a normal vault, and an ICL with a low vault. Now let's look uh, at quick three videos, and this is the toric marking. The toric marking is not unlike what we actually do for cataracts, and we need to do the markings in the, on the slit lamp in the sitting position, and then mark across on the axis. And this, again, has to be very, very uh, accurate. Now, the ICL loading, and this is, again, a very important part of the whole procedure, and this is where the technique actually lies. So the ICL is taken out of its housing, and it is uh, in BSS. Therefore, it does not expand when it is placed into the anterior chamber of the eye. So it goes into that boat-shaped uh, injector, and once it is placed there, then from the anterior part, from the nozzle, it is drawn into the nozzle and uh, it stays there uh, very well. Then it is pushed by the plunger where the, uh, uh, it will go into the anterior chamber. So during the insertion, what happens, uh, what we need to do is to place viscoelastic inside the anterior chamber. And this, the amount of viscoelastic that has to be placed is very important. It should not be an overfill. It should not be an underfill. So when the strands of the viscoelastic methyl cellulose become one with the, each other, that is the point where you should stop, and that is optimum. And then the, the ICL is placed inside the eye, inside the anterior chamber, never directly into the sulcus. And it should land actually on the iris surface. So this, when it is landing a little lopsided, it just has to be twirled around so that it's the right side up, and that is very, very important. The next part is very simple, tucking in the haptics, and they have to be tucked right into the, uh, under the iris once, and uh, once they are placed there, it has to be very, very uh, atraumatically done, and the negotiation of the haptics are quite simple. And then, of course, if it's a toric ICL, it needs to be placed in the alignment of the toric axis. The removal of the viscoelastic is important, and uh, that's where the aquaports also help, and it can be well removed, and ultimately, while the hydration of the ports are being done, it has to be very important and it, one should make sure that the toricity is correct. Thank you very much and these are the miles and miles of smiles from these very high myopes that we have at the end of the day. Oh. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next, next job. Uh, for the nice presentation. So next, uh, we'll have uh, Dr. Gaurav, 
Lutra, he'll be talking about his experience, a single surgeon's experience in a clinical practice of ICL. A very good evening to everyone and uh, thanks for asking me to speak on this. It's one of my uh, favorite topics to speak on, but I have a collection of a uh, few videos which uh, I was asked to share. So I pulled out this video of my first ICL about few, maybe 12, 13 years back. And you can see that how hesitantly I was loading. Why I always uh, end up showing this is because uh, with ICL, at least with the star one, I think the loading is probably the one area which probably uh, every beginner has to go through uh, loading the ICL. Of course, once you get through it, then it becomes much easier. So you can see that hesitation in pulling the ICL through to the tunnel is uh, not going to help. So you bring the ICL back and that smooth motion comes within two, three cases. So after the first two, three cases, you actually realize how it has to be loaded. So that one smooth motion, as you can see here now. And of course, you'll see those primitive style forceps, which we used to use. And now uh, we have much better forceps. And what hasn't changed is that uh, I see the star has still not been able to give us a preloaded lens or something. There, there was talk about it, and that would have solved so many things. But the injector system remains the same. So going on, now uh, one very, very important take home message from uh, today should be that uh, you know, sometimes because we are all getting used to doing wound assisted injections. Now wound assisted injection does not work for ICL. It's very, very important to remember that you need, again, this is a very old video right from the early days that uh, when I was operating and you can see what happened. I was trying to squeeze in that incision. You know, you try to think that you can go from a smaller incision. You need to have an adequate incision, about three millimeters at least. And in the beginning, at least 3.5. Today, I usually make about 2.8 to 3. But uh, your nozzles, uh, the tip of the cartridge should be on the inner lip of the wound at least, if not inside the wound. It cannot be on the outer lip, otherwise there will be that aborted injection and you will have an ICL stuck uh, in the wound which can be a big, big problem. So no wound assisted injections for the star ICL at least. This is what can happen when uh, you try to do a wound assisted injection. Let's just see this small clip. I'll take you straight to the point where we are injecting. and. This is where, you know, again, it was a bit of a wound assisted. Let me take you back here. And here we are, you can see that the nozzle is not, the tip is not right at the inner lip. And you can see that as the counter pressure was not probably enough, this thing got disengaged. And now we have an ICL which is stuck. Now this is a disaster because ICL is really, really thin. It's made of material which is just about 50 microns thick as Dr. Partha just said. And you cannot actually play around with the ICL with any of your instruments. So that can be a problem. And then now it's a challenge. Either you want, you can push it in or you can pull it out and what kind of uh, ways to use. So eventually, you know, I was in a dilemma and what kind of forceps to use. We eventually try to do push that back in or out. And then finally, I managed to actually squeeze it in and somehow half expecting that I'll have to explant this lens. Uh, and most of the times you don't have a replacement lens either. And you don't want to be doing this either. You don't want it to be manipulated with any kind of a manipulator inside because you can scratch the optic. So once your lens is in, of course, you can handle it. The best part, best thing is never to be stuck in such a situation. And I think if you just take care of what few things I told you about the wound assisted injection and having good counter pressure and adequate incision size, you will probably never get into this situation at all. So looking at this uh, small video, now another small pearl, you can see what happened here. As I started to inject over here, the tip of the cartridge, you can see a small portion of the ICL probably jutting out. Just see, you know, I'm just looking at it under the microscope and I thought I'll be able to get through. Now, sometimes when you load it and your assistant keeps it for a while and then puts it back, you have to be extremely careful that the tip is not projecting in front. Uh, and if that happens, usually you will have an aborted injection because the ICL would have twisted or turned and it won't uh, come out the correct way. So again, you are in a situation where which you don't want to be in. So please be careful when you look at it under the microscope that there is no projection from the smallest of the tips in front. Now, during injection, sometimes the ICL will rotate. And uh, so you have to actually ensure that before you start injecting, all three holes of the ICL should be facing you straight under the microscope. If the central hole and the two other holes are facing you and they're in one line, then the chances of this happening are not significant. But otherwise, 
you know, and I noticed at this point that the ICL was opening the wrong side. So I've twisted my injector a little bit and hoping to get it in the right way. So you can manipulate as long as the ICL is not fully delivered, you can abort it and you can maybe do some maneuvers to ensure that this opens the right side way. But best thing is to be careful not to let that happen as, as I said before. Now sometimes uh, once you've injected the lens and you've put in the haptics nicely, you will have, uh, it's fairly easy to do this as long as your chamber is not over inflated with viscoelastic, there will be always enough space under the iris. So never let your chamber get over inflated and uh, then you can just tuck the haptics and when you're fairly confident, uh, in early days we all end up using pilocarpine to be sure that the haptics are nicely there and they're not tucked but towards, uh, I mean, last few years I don't use pilocarpine at all. Uh, we just use, leave it like this. But just watch uh, over here. I'm just going to pause this and take you back a few seconds you will probably notice that the pupil is a little peaked. Now, you must watch out for this. If you notice even the slightest of peaking, that means something is not right. Either there is a tuck or there is a haptic which is coming out. So we immediately realized that the haptic had popped out during the process of uh, positioning. And uh, so you can just go back and put it back in. And again, if you're not using pilocarpine, you have to be very sure that your haptics are all in. Otherwise, you will have a problem. And also, there should be no tuck on the iris in the periphery. It should be free. Otherwise, again, you'll have a problem next day and you'll have to bring the patient back. Now, sometimes uh, these incisions being slightly larger than usual, you will have incisions which may be leaky, especially if you've had a stuck wound, uh, stuck ICL. Now, you can see this is a nice, cool way of uh, you know, checking for that and I just put a few drops of trypan blue and that will immediately show if you can watch that again. You can just put, you can see the flow of fluid from here and you can immediately know which of your wounds is leaky and then you can go and make a supraincisional tunnel. So here I'm just going slightly anterior to that original wound and just creating a pocket here and then I'm just going to hydrate the pocket. So you don't need to struggle in sealing your wound by going on all sides and then you can see that now it's nicely sealed. So it just takes few seconds and it really works well. Even in pediatric cataract, if you want to seal the wound nicely, you can just make this supraincisional tunnel. It works extremely well. And uh, sometimes you will have an ICL which gets uh, inverted during injection. Now that can again be a big issue because you can see here that in spite of our best efforts, the ICL came out upside down. Then of course, it's not difficult. You can just don't flip it inside. Just hold one of the haptics. I'll finish this video and we'll be over. So you can just hold one of the ears of the ICL and pull on it. Just comes out nicely through the three millimeter incision. And then of course, you can reload and uh, put it back. It works quite well. And you have to be careful that the injection goes as smoothly as you can. And of course, there are lots of more situations I would have loved to share. But for lack of time, I think I'll stop here. I'm sure there are more speakers who are going to cover all the other situations as well. Thank you so much. do not want to risk anything. On the other hand, the other uh, alternatives that are available are made up of hydrophilic acrylic. This was a concern, but now they also have a reasonable track record. And in about the last five years or so that I have used these lenses, I have not the occasion to repent that uh, I have put in a, um, a lens of an inferior material. Now, both these lenses have central holes because of which a peripheral hydrotomy is not necessary. The haptics is four in number as far as the ICL is concerned. That allows the lens to be well-centered. While in the case of an ICL, it's more six in number, and the company claims that it centers even better. And uh, uh, the, you have to dial these ICL, toric ICLs in place because it's not that it's always comes in orientation of 0, 180. On the other hand, when it comes to an IPCL, one advantage is that each and every one of these toric IPCLs are custom made for an individual eye so that in each case, you can leave it at uh, uh, 0, 180 degrees, hardly any rotation is necessary. The size of the holes wise, the ICL has a central hole of 360 micron. On bench studies have shown that this not, does not cause any dysphotopsia or diffraction problems. In the case of a IPCL, it's 360 in the center and 400 in the sides. And uh, as uh, the one very important factor that you got to get used to is the fact that in the ICL is the leading right edge, which has a mark over here. And in the IPCL, this small collar stud is on the leading left edge and the trailing right edge. When we are shifting from ICL to IPCL or when you start using both of them, you need to know that the trailing, that uh, the marks are exactly opposite orientation and you need to use these lenses accordingly. 
the icl is dispensed in the present evo icl is dispensed in bss because of which it doesn't expand once it's introduced into i while ipcl is uh, is dispensed in saline and loading is slightly different as far as icl is concerned and that's just something that you have to learn while ipcl if you are used to loading some hydrophilic acrylic lenses is very similar to that so again as far as the overall optic size is concerned uh, the icl comes in 5 and 6.1 mm evo has been enlarged while in a case of ipcl it comes in a choice of uh, sizes between 5.75 to 6.2 and in case you have a patient with a highly mesopic pupil then you can even custom make a lens with a larger diameter which of course takes a little longer to deliver and uh, this is just a short video of the ipcl being implanted you can see in this particular case that uh, you see this uh, stud over here and this is essentially on the leading left edge and that's the way the lens has to be oriented there are also two para optic holes over here this has to be co coming on the superior side one thing i could not understand is that why does this lens have so many holes i do, really do feel that's not quite necessary maybe a couple of these para optic holes are not necessary and still the lens would function quite optimally as i said loading of these lenses is very similar to the um, uh, to the hydrophilic acrylic lenses only thing is you do not use viscoelastic in these situations but just use uh, saline or bss and then place these lenses and make sure you the soft lenses tucked in be, below the flanges of the um, loading haptic and then gently close it while you are pressurizing on the central area initially we had a few occasions when the optic got caught and there was a tear of these lenses but now that we have got used to them this rarely ever happens the good thing is the company always supplies you a an extra lens so that just in case there is a problem you can um, use the uh, replacement lens i make a good 3 mm lens uh, incision both for my icl and ipcl because i don't want a wound assisted implantation but want the mouth of my cartridge of the uh, inside the anterior chamber which gives me extreme precision and control in the in during the interaction of these lenses i most often introduce these lenses using the varion guidance one of the older videos which i wanted to use here and you can say it's always injected into the anterior chamber then you very gently tuck it behind the iris and then subsequently orient the markings along the toric markings that are over there removal of the viscoelastic is in a complete manner is mandatory for all these lenses and the availability of hole in the center further facilitates complete removal we have published couple of studies on this one is on cl in clinical ophthalmology on the long term safety of ipcl another is in ijo where we compared icl and ipcl I very quickly go through this this was a retrospective analysis of one year period uh, both the group showed similar profile and i'll just uh, run through these slides 121 and 203 with the number of uh, 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 lenses which are compared and what was most important that the post op uh, uncorrected dis uh, distant visual acuity was as pre op best corrected distant visual acuity both in the ipcl and I icl was very comparable again improvement in post op uncorrected distant visual acuity over pre op best corrected visual acuity almost showed similar profiles and as far as the safety is concerned that is uh, the vision not deteriorating less than the best corrected visual acuity pre op again the profile was exactly the same and uh, uh, the predictability of the refractive outcome and the astigmatism outcome when it was toric and trochlear icls or ipcls again was quite comparable and in um, the stability of these lenses over the one pe one year period of follow up was also exactly similar we'll just show a couple of quick videos uh, this is a cataract which developed post ipcl implantation in these situations when this cataract has to come out it's uh, quite easy to uh, remove especially this happens when you are dealing with uh, higher grades of refractive error um this uh, this lens was minus 17 and higher age group this patient was actually 45 years of age and this is an experience that we have with icls also in the sense that whenever it's a higher grade of refractive error and higher age group there is greater propensity for cataract only when it's an anterior subcapsular cataract as in this case you actually blame the lens and both these lenses can be brought out through the same 2.8 to 3 mm incision that you made initially because these lenses nicely fold over upon themselves and subsequently of course the cataract has to come out and a intraocular lens has to implanted 
And whenever th these lenses are not positioned optimally, then it's important that uh, there's a very own guidance in place. And it's a couple of minutes job to reorient these lenses to exactly position where they are so that you get an optimal outcome. I don't even introduce any viscoelastic, but just go in with an irrigation cannula and subsequently align the lenses along the um, very own axis. So suffice it to say that uh, ICL is a great product and I think any serious refractive surgeon must be doing fake intraocular lenses and uh, uh, the availability of uh, IPCL and other, other Indian lenses is a viable alternative when you want to offer this to a wider cross-section of your patients. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Now we have Dr. K.K. Mehta who will be speaking to us to, regarding complications of fake IOLs. Before he sets up, uh, the, for the beginners, the two most important uh, thing in ICL uh, is that uh, the anti-chamber depth, okay, so it's around 3 millimeters, it has to be 3 millimeters and your white to white. So these two are the most important parameters when you start ICL. So a measurement of the lens is important because if you keep a, a big lens, or a small lens, the, there might be shallowing of the angle or there may be an uh, IOL, the uh, lens touch resulting in cataract. So these two are very important when you start uh, uh, ICL. So you should personally measure by yourself the size and also the antechamber depth either through uh, uh, pentacam or off scan, you should be able to measure it properly. So these two are very important for people who start ICL. Any other questions? We can have it now. Any questions uh, regarding ICL, you can ask. What about in high hypermetropia where there is a shadowing of the antechamber? Yeah, that's always a problem. problem. Because uh, we have done a few cases of uh, hypermetropia, but uh, uh, fortunately, if the AC depth is more than three, only we are going to do. We are not going to do less than that. But in hyperopes, uh, as you say, it's very difficult to get a very deep anterior chamber. So I think we have done a few cases and uh, who have an anterior chamber depth of more than three, and they do well, and uh, there is no issues with that. We have to keep the parameter. That's what I was kept telling. Even hyperopia, you have to maintain that. Uh, Yeah. Three, three is here. Yeah. Okay, just sorry. Technology as it gets better also gives you more headaches. We always have to carry a spare, good enough. Uh, complications. Uh, as we are all aware, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but just to start off by turning around and saying that fakey guyers are not only IPCLs and ICLs as we everybody talks about, but most of the anterior chamber lenses have come and gone over a period of time. Uh, these, the, the vertical support lenses had come across. Alcon actually had brought out one just about two years earlier. And we had the iris clip lenses, we had the Borscher lenses. But all of these unfortunately had problems that they all fell by the roadside due to the propensity to land up with endothelial damage. And classically the endothelial damage occurs and the little lower than the horizontal plane, which is apparently where the lenses tend to touch when the iris tends to hit on. So this is one of the reasons why the anterior chamber lenses went into disrepute. The ICL pattern is the only one which seems to have worked over a period of time. 
But the problem with the ICL always has been the vault problem. Ideal placement involves having the ICL bend forwards and the vault should be more than adequate, which is unfortunately a problem which tends to occur more often than not. The excessive vaulting can cause... Uh, the, we have a torch which works? No. Just... No. Thank you. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, so what I what I want you to look at is the vaults. As you notice, the variation in vaults which occur down the line, and excessive vaulting can lead to contact with the posterior surface of the iris. Let me show you some of the problems which occur because of that. Instrumentations in the earlier days, the company used to tell us that the thing to utilize was just a measuring device on the cornea directly, which you see in the middle. Didn't prove out to be very correct, but we found then the Schwinn, the, uh, the Cirrus Schwein fluke images came out. But the one which gives the best results, of course, is the Visante, which enables you to measure it to, to a high level of accuracy. But a big problem always has been to get the vault perfectly correct. The ideal vault is a 400 micron vault because over a period of time, measured over a period of 8 to 10 years, the vault progressively decreases. See, if you are left with a 200 vault, it will become to 100 or 180 and you will then land up with difficulty. There are various, I am not going to talk to you about the video because it is not really pertinent because you have seen more than enough. Results in all these cases has always been excellent. Accountability, the, mani the manifest refraction, and over a period of time, the improvement tends to occur. Astigmatic stability is good. So again, nothing much to talk about. The results are excellent when it works well. But when it doesn't work well is where the problems come across. In complications, one of the problems is that we do are not careful about selecting our cases. We have to be certain that the iridocorneal angle is more than 30 degrees. If it is not, then you are going to have problems with the period of time. Endothelial cell count invariably drops after doing ICL. I have seen people who turn around and say that no, they never have an endothelial cell count drop. Either they don't measure it or they have got bias as far as their own endothelial patients are concerned. It invariably drops over a period of time. So you need to have a check and as it runs. Now, when you measure the variance which tends to occur, as you will notice in some of my cases, this is a 900 micron clearance, running down to a 690, running down to 481. The measurements lie on the, on the screen at the bottom, and running down to 264, and running down to 195, which I know over a period of time is going to, or 140, which is going to give us trouble given a period of time. So you do have to be careful with these high walls. What, what is a problem with the high vault also is that the lenticular touch tends to occur. And as you will notice here, the cataract tends to start developing at this point here. So these are the problems which tend to occur once the vault starts to develop. And you will notice here a series of cases where the early attachment or addition is starting to develop. You rarely get a full-blown cataract like this. More often not, it is just a central touch and you see a little grey haze developing in the middle which tells you that the vision is going to start falling and the patient is going to come to you and you notice that. The other big problem is that you do occasionally tend to get a retinal detachment. There has been a number of papers including by Ruiz Moreno and Castello which said that the risk of RD has been comparatively higher following ICL insertion. But really it is not that much as a fact is that if we do not evaluate the retinas in, high, in, in, in a level of accuracy which we should do because we just want to do the surgery as it runs. Other big problem is with glaucoma. Pigmentary changes tend to develop especially because the, the ICL tends to rub against the iris and it tends to cause pigment deposition. So the important thing you need to do after doing ICL is to evaluate the angle and specifically look for, see, the line of pigment deposition along these lines. And these are essentially what you have to look for because this is the one problem which tends to occur. 
Once you see this, you know that your patient is going to go in for glaucoma. There's a simple way to treat this problem when the glaucoma occurs. Just go into the anterior chamber and wash it out. Believe me, the glaucoma seems to vanish completely. It requires no treatment, nothing, just a simple AC wash. Do that, you'll find it works well. Causes of ICL explantation, improper sizing, cataract, as a residual astigmatism, glare. In summary, all these can be easily handled. Make sure your vault is perfect, number one. Make, if the vault is inadequate, try and exchange the IOL. It is easy to do that. If the vault is too high, all you need to do is to just trim the edge of the implant, which is easy to do. Just a microscopic trimming is enough to cause a vault to fall back. If you find pigmentary glaucoma, simply wash your chamber, the problem goes away. Thank you. And a little plug for I advance, 29th, 30th, 31st, don't forget. Thank you. I think next we are going with the live surgery. <coughs> huh? Put off the warrior. Okay, thank you. Can you just make it minus two? <coughs> this side, this side. Okay. Okay. Same here. Okay. Thank you. Block the any Topic of parakin dalobe, please. Parakin, please. What is he saying? Sorry. Parakin, please. Parakin, please. Once more. The chair is slippery. You have to be relaxed. Huh? You have to look. You can understand English? Yes, sir, but so bright. Yes. Ah, light will be brighter. Huh? Don't worry. Switches. But you have to focus onto the light only, okay? Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir, we can this hear you. Can you come here? Dr. Titiya? It will be easier, no? Yeah, you can hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to start uh, a fake uh, a posterior fake eye uh, We have taken a star ICL lens with uh, center aqua port, B4 series, B4C series. And she's a young girl, and she had a reflector of minus five with one cell. So ICL power is minus seven with plus one cell at uh, what axis? Can you can you portray the parameters? What is this? So I'll just show how to load the lens first. So this is. The ICL cartridge I have, first it has to be uh, lubricated with uh, BSS solution. That is very, very important because you have to just clean everything, debris, because this is a hydrophobic surface. Then replace with the, you know, uh, methyl cellulose SPMC. I hope it is FC, uh, STFC, you know, not sure. So this is very, very important. This looks like, looks like helon only. Where is the box? Sorry. <laughs> Keep it there. Now take out the lens. This is the lens. I'll decrease the magnification so that you can see the lens clearly. You see uh, the lens is there. 
it can be taken out. Make sure your uh, bud is hydrated so that it, you can see now it's going to come out. Make sure you rotate your hand in such a manner that once it gets attached to the bottle like this, very difficult. I might put it back so that it's wet again because it doesn't, <coughs> it's not nice to have lens which is dehydrated because it will get attached to the bottle or cap. So make sure you rotate the lens, get a good curvature, then turn your to the parallel to the tip and get a little bit of fluid up to the anterior surface, that will come out very nicely. So this is the correct way to have the lens. Subsequently, can you put a methyl cellulose over this? Bisco, dusra bisco dirna, apna wala? So we have a bisco field here. Put the lens into the visco. This looks like a helon only system. It's very, very bolus. It should be a methyl cellulose, otherwise, lens gets into the bolus phase. This is a bit. No? Huh? It's a helon, no? That's very difficult. So just press, the lens will go inside. Just pull the lens. This is no. Something is wrong, so this methyl cellulose is too bad. So this is a toric implantation. We have a baryon captured for this patient. So I have to make sure that <coughs> this is uh, the, the, the central hole and all the three are in the central place. Put inside the uh, injector. Let's go injectable again. This is the ICL forces. I'll go inside. Now catch this right in the middle and have a good hole, big hole there. Then pull it uh, gently and uh, withdraw your hand as well as pull the lens also. Make sure it comes clean up to the tip. You can see the entire lens in the tip here. That will give a nice orientation here. The less chances of getting <laughs> chipping of the lens if you open correctly to a full extent. Just rotate your uh, cartridge in one way. Just try to push and see if the lens is freely mobile. Because the helon is coming out. This is the first time we use helon for a lens loading. Put into the bottle, inside the bottle. The lens has to be put inside the bottle again. Should not get dehydrated. <coughs> Dr. Titiel, you so always you know. first load the uh, lens and then you go to the patient. That's the way you always do? Normally, normally uh, I do an incision first. Okay. Then go uh, visco then. Where is your visco, the big cannula? This is not a visco, please. Other one you had, no? <coughs> Methyl cello, SPMC, you had a bigger syringe, no? 5cc syringe uh, in this. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no problem. Can you show the uh, video the, to, the, to the camera? Access? From the camera, you can, because you cannot be... Uh, you can see, uh, can you see the variant overlay? No. Audience? No, we are not able to see no. the, yeah, now. Okay, now we are able to see. Okay, it. now I'm going to make an incision, you know, which is 180 degrees. Make sure your uh, blade is not towards the lens, it should be opposed to the cornea, so they don't touch the anterior segment. Then I do two side ports. This is a one millimeter side port. Again, the direction should be towards the cornea, not towards the vitreous cavity. Can you take off the varion now? It's not required. Uh, otherwise, sometimes you can touch the lens because that's very, very critical. And when I do my incisions, there's no leakage or aqueous. So I have two incisions now. I'll use Helon for an injection. Uh, I use, normally, I've been using since beginning of my Mike, ICL you... time, I use... Can you just adjust the microscope? Sure. Yeah, slightly down. Little bit centration. I have a beautiful centration here. Yeah, this is from monitor they are showing. Yeah. It's not microscope. Better microscope we use better. We don't. Uh, yes, ah, yeah. yes, yes. That's microscope. I have, I have perfect centration. It is all right now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, now it's no, fine. Actually, sir. they were showing the TV. They were not showing your live. Okay. Uh, this thing. Okay. Okay. Now you have the live. Yeah, now, now we are able to see. Okay. So when I inject uh, my helon here, you have to make sure you don't go inside, too much inside, you just be in the, in the edge of the incision, keep injecting 
so they don't touch the anterior capsular lens. This is very, very critical. Otherwise, sometimes you have a habit of doing a cataract surgery, and it goes directly inside and touch the lens capsule. Again, they have converted the... Yeah, uh, yeah. shift to microscope shift view. Yeah. Please show the microscope view only. Yeah, so final alignment you can show video. Don't show the screen now. I'll show the screen towards the end. Only the microscope view. Okay, thank you. So normally I'll fix it in my left hand and inject the lens. But this time I'm not sure because I have a helon inside and helon in the lens also. Go gently and make sure the lens opens now. It is opening correctly. Once it opens correctly, you can inject further. So if you are a little worried, you can leave it at the wound area. Just tuck it. It will open very correctly now. So it is open beautifully now. What I have to do now, inject a little bit of helon so that you have a deeper surface for handling over the lens. Go with the manipulator now, fix the globe. Better light me dekhte rena. With your side port. Avoid touching the central optic area, go to periphery. Tuck the lens, pull the lens towards the center so that you can see the edge of the haptic. Rotate a little bit towards the left side so it will get inside. Similarly here, tuck it and rotate towards the left side, it will go inside. So this is a three-way uh, action. Pull it, depress it, rotate it, it goes inside. Then rotate your hand to the proximal uh, area. Again, pull it to the center, depress it, and rotate to the left side, it will go inside. Similarly here, pull it and rotate, it goes inside. Now all the four haptics are inside. You can now tuck it now. The idea now is to center the lens to an axis which is required, and that should be done before you remove the viscoelastic here. So this is the time I require a very own uh, overlay so that I know that my lens is properly expressed. So this was supposed to be put, put anti-clockwise four, clock, four degrees, so just now it is almost there because it's very difficult to rotate after you remove the viscoelastic in ICL surgery, unlike in you know, a cataract surgery where you have to remove the viscoelastic, then align the lens, it is totally different here. So I'm right on to the, the required axis. Can you show the screen now at this stage? But uh, the screen uh, shows uh, this one only, no? The Varion shows this, no? I'm going to align the Varion now. Perfectly aligned here. So I'll take out the viscoelastic with a little bit with my uh, first with uh, irrigation. Just go and this is what it does. Helon will come out as a bolus. The majority of helon has come out now and now hydrate the wound area. Can you take out the uh, variant, please? So once I've hydrated the main wound, I'll go with my bimanual aspirator so that you have a very controlled aspiration happening inside the eye. And you can use uh, the aspirator to take out a viscoelastic from over the ICL and underneath the ICL, both way through the hole which we have. To require a little uh, better uh, bimanual, uh, this thing which goes, this is a 23 gauge uh, bimanual. I'll take out the viscoelastic first. And this is how a good bimanual will do it, and just go to the aqua port and remove the entire viscoelastic from underneath. Then take to the peripheral port, take a viscoelastic from there. Come to this side and take out a viscoelastic from here. So this is the advantage with the uh, bimanual aspirator. You have a maintained chamber, and the axis is well aligned. The lens did not move at all. So that is what I said. You have to first align the lens before you remove the viscoelastic. In these cases. Now, light me, Dekhubita. Ramya, can look towards the light. Up, yeah, good. Now I have to just hydrate my side port and chamber will get formed. In RP center, I have access to an intra-op uh, OCT integrated microscope. I can see my bolt on the table as such. And uh, that gives you an idea how effective your bolt has been on table. And we have seen that in the post-op period, it matches very, very nicely. And though there has been no instances where I had to explant the lens on table, 
because your calculation has been so uh, nicely done in these cases nowadays, you really get a surprise. So this ends the surgery and the lens is well aligned. Thank you for watching. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Tritial. That was a wonderful surgery. So do, do you use yeah. pilocarpin uh, um, um, after surgery? Uh, no, I, yeah. I uh, don't use pilocarpin in these cases because uh, that is not desirable at all. Okay. And uh, because you have an aqua port and you have done a nice viscoelastic removal, the pilocarpin is not desirable in these cases. Do you have a nice... And normally I see my patient after a, a two hours of surgery and see what is the intraocular pressure. And if uh, I have not done intraop OCT, then I get an ASOCT done immediately afterwards to see what is the exact uh, position of your patient. And it is important to you know, check your IOP and ball within the first few hours so that if you have to do something, you can do immediately also. So what is your post-op regime, Dr. Tetial? Post-op regime in these cases, I start with a steroid, which is normally uh, played acetate, four times a day for uh, four weeks in a tapering doses, and use uh, one antibiotic for two weeks and lubricating drops. No midriatic in these cases in a post-op period. Okay. Okay, Titian, that was a wonderful surgery. Thank you, Beta. Th you did thank very you very well. much. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll go to the okay, uh, last talk of today. Uh, Dr. RIL, uh, the fake IOL follow-up and outcome. I would like to call upon Dr. J.K. Reddy. He was uh, involved in the designing of this lens, so I think he's the best person to talk about RIL. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. we'll... Pardon, Pardon me? Measure to white, white. Yeah, I will tell. <laughs> That's good. Um, yeah, coming to the yeah. next, uh, the talk is uh, RIL is uh, what is RIL? This is a fake. Of course, it, uh, this uh, symposium is on fake. Fake RIL refractive implant lens. I just labeled it like that for a lot of reasons, and uh, because Reliance is very popular in uh, India, I think it's very catchy to be named. So where is that? You have seen a lot of presentations now where it sits and everything you are well aware. So what we did uh, in this as you are telling this, uh, what are the critical parameters white to white and ACD. So what we did during designing the, this lens is instead of just copying the ICL, we collected all the complications, why it is so difficult to do the ICL, why it is not picking up, why surgeons are very hesitant. So we collected all the data from the practicing surgeons and non-practicing surgeons who are hesitant to do it and all the complications and we try to minimize these complications and design this lens so we are getting a very good results. The white to white measurement is the digital caliper is the cheapest and the best one and the RB scan is the most reliable and the pentacam is reasonably good. Remaining all are very arbitrary. If you use IOL mask it's okay but you have to reduce by 0.5. Uh, 0.4 to 0.5 from my oil master white to white, but it's not very reliable. It's a reasonably good, but you have to take, reduce it. If you take directly white to white from my oil master, that overestimates the white to white and you land up in trouble. And of course, you have to verify with the digital caliper uh, every case, all the cases. Uh, nowadays, I don't do it, but how to measure digital caliper is very simple. Put a topical drop and you can do it in slit lamp. But the company recommends only under microscope. We don't need. I never did in my life under microscope. Not even a single patient. I did only in the slit lamp. You can do it. It's it's very comfortable and you can do it. And the other critical parameter is the ACD. As uh, Dr. Devdutt has asked, what is what you do it? Hypermetropia. It's a must. 3.1 plus or because 0.1 is error. Three millimeters is must. Hypermetropia. Myopia 2.8. They do very well. And it can be done with any anything, even a scan you can use it, but you have to reduce corneal thickness. And in Pentacam or in, in all instruments, they give it now optical biometers. We are using routinely to measure this one. IOL master gives from epithelium to the lens, so you have to reduce the corneal thickness because it's internal ACD is the 2.8, not from the epithelium. From endothelium to the lens is the 2.8, which is important. 2.7 is also okay. Then, as I told you, in design, we took a lot of parameters and did it. The main difference, I told you, is the sizing. The ICL comes 12, 12.6, 13.2, 13.6. So you had to adjust the lens whichever fits well for that particular patient. 
the standard teaching is y to white plus one millimeter. The lens should be y to white plus one millimeter. So if you have a 12.2 millimeter, 12 millimeter or 11.9, you get confused whether you give 12.6 or 13.2. If you go 12.82 millimeter, ICL recommends 13.2. <coughs> if you go 11.89, like that, there is a confusion. So what we did in here is we are giving every 0.25 millimeter the lens size. 11, 11.5, 11. 11 point 12, 12.25, 12.5, 12.75. 13 millimeters, 13.25, 13.5, 13.75, and even we can make 14. So the size every 0.25 millimeters, so there is no question of higher vault or lower vault if your measurement is correct. Then uh, there is a uh, uh, like in ICL. So that, that's the one we did. The second thing what we realized is, this is the vault. The vault, if you maintain 1.3 millimeters vault in manufacturing the lens consistently for each power, then you never get lens touch and capsule, anti capsule cataract, even if you use undersized ICL lens. Even if you undersized RIL, if you use it, if you kick lens, the lens rotates and moves in the eye. So you can explant it, but you never get a cataract. You will get always a vault if you maintain this vault. So we maintain the, we change that parameter. So even by mistake, measurement goes wrong or something goes wrong, calculation, you ordered a wrong one and you used a small lens still you don't get cataract in RIL. You can just explant and put a correct size. And this is the shape of the lens. And the implantation is very simple. You have to seen an expert like uh, Jeevan um, doing, taking care so much to handle the lens, birds, nothing. You can just take your, I recommend a good forceps, a titanium forceps, and uh, load it like you are loading. A little bit careful. And you can do incision assisted uh, uh, injection, you don't need to be worried. As you are pushing the lens itself, it will nicely open it up. There are critical elements in the structure of the lens which make the lens open up. So those areas, we have strengthened it so that it opens very nicely. Whereas ICL, somehow they are not done, they have designed patent and designed registered in across the country. It is so thin in some parts, it will stick together, it will take long time to open. Those areas, we made it structurally more stronger, so immediately it will open. And there is no central hole. And you got two venting, uh, aqueous venting ports. And they are the markers for the uh, axis also. There is no extra marker. So you orient that. And insertion is very easy. Just pull it and push it. That's all it goes very comfortably. Uh, just you have to just a little bit. Gently you, you just um, rotate it. That's all. Already it's finished. It's unedited one. It's unedited video. It's a lot full time, it took almost two to three minutes it will take. And you can just go, one port is good enough. Sometimes I, we don't make this port also, main incision is good enough. You can just bend Sinsky a little bit curved one, and you can pull and do it. You can make your Sinsky instead of straight, you can bend it a little bit, and you can do that too, if you don't like the other port. And this incision, these openings are quite good, so you can wash off that. Post-operatively, you, you consistently get a good vault, and if you by mistake do it, you get a over vault. Otherwise, yeah, they do very well. Even we do very complicated cases like post PK, post dark, and sort of cases. Hypermotors, I did around 10. And uh, there is the very important thing the peripheral chamber will be maintained. They, they usually, in uh, all the lenses, fake lenses, they said we give a peripheral curve to straight away from that. So we could manage this one very nicely. Even in the periphery, it just looks like a normal patient. It, even after ICL, all periphery iris will be bowed like a closed angle glaucoma. You don't see that here with this design. You just see a normal uh, peripheral angle on any angle, both temporal and nasal, all angles looks normal. And uh, there is no central hole. And uh, you don't need to worry about the uh, glaucoma. You don't need to do a PI, except for hypermetropia. And there is no central hole for aqueous drainage and in future we are planning for a uh, pseudo fake i mean prosperopia correction uh, for a hypermetro or a normal even normal we are planning we already manufactured we have to do trials of prosperopia and this is the patient which we operated initially investigated lens four years back follow up just last week when uh, the patient came it looks so beautiful it doesn't look like anything surgery done at all no holes no pis nothing no erect means undilated, dilated. And uh, when I saw that patient, I remembered this is what 
or we call him chief, we work with uh, Arvind, Dr. Jivan Somi, who was a um, main architect of Arvind Nikel system. Uh, his words I remember when he used to repeat these words and it's always nice to see something you did beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think that brings us to the end of the session. Um, okay. So any uh, questions? Pardon me? Lens cost is uh, very nominal. Um, it's almost cost one third the price of uh, uh, ICL or even less. The, f the f uh, spears are really cheap, the spherical lenses. Uh, only the cylinders, each lens is custom designed for cylinder. So they are taking uh, three weeks lead time, that's the problem. We are asking 15 days, there's some problem with the government. You have to have sterilization, 15 days then only release the batch. So they are taking three weeks. Um, spears are just you get in a day or two. And they do supply two lenses, Once, one you can use it, second you can return. And if you fall, the other lens falls, you can use it second. Vault range of 600 microns is ideal because 400 is not good what we found because we are operating very young patient, 21 years. By 55, another 300 microns, 200 microns, the lens will thickness will increase anteriorly. So 600 to 650 is the most ideal one. Sir, in case we have to expand the lens, do we have to extend See, the just you don't need to do anything. It's very easy. Just pull it off, just lift it, put a heel on in the anterior chamber. Don't use uh, methyl cellulose put a heel on or sodium in the antechamber, take a Sinsky hook, dilate the pupil, push it, one haptic, one foot plate will come out. Just hold the foot, uh, foot plate with a good forceps. Uh, here, we are not having any forceps to pull the ICL, okay? So we don't, so better you buy one ICL loading forceps and keep it with you. And you can just hold it and pull it, it comes. It, it won't flip usually, it won't flip. Here, uh, if the lens doesn't flip. Uh, if, if, if it flips, then you, I don't recommend flipping it back in the anterior chamber with heel on. You take it out and uh, you use the other lens, spare lens they have given you. Pardon me? No peripheral except for hypermetropia. If you are doing plus patient, you have to do PI. Minus, no PI. Thank no, you. Those are all unfit, you know. Usually, nanophthalma, keratoglobus, uh, large you know, corneas. So generally, we don't recommend because we don't have a large lead database. And nanophthalma's usual antechamber will be shallow. It's almost impossible. Uh, even hypermetropes we saw, we, check, we are checking, checking. Only... 10%, 5%, you have more than 3.1. Remaining all, you have very uh, shallow chambers, 2.8, 2.7. Most of them coupon coming borderline, 2.7, 2.75 like that in hypermetrops. Pardon me? PA and ICL, RIL? No. Anything less than 3 is not ideal because in hypermetrop, the lens thickness in central will be the convex lens. In myop, it is a concave lens inside. So that's the difference. That's why in hypermetropes, you need a more anterior chamber depth than in myops. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>